But as you saw uh, and heard, we're in a brand new series, starting today for the next 10 weeks in the book of the Psalms. And some of you have those little uh, journals to follow along with the, some introductory material and each week's text, a psalm, and places to take notes. If you don't have one of those, uh, we're out. We've printed up over 1,000, and they've all been taken. So we're going to print more, don't, don't fear, but uh, we'll have them for you next week. But that's if you're wondering where, where your special book is, well, come back next week. It's a, it's, a, it's a trick. You have to come back next week to get your book. Uh, but we, we do want to invite you to follow along with us and track with us as we read through the psalms together. And I hope you see this series as an invitation to do just that to read, to pray, to study in this remarkable uh, book called the Psalms. How many of you, I don't have to ask this because I know that it's, it happens to all of us, but when was the last time you had a song stuck in your head you couldn't get out of your head? Anybody recently? Why does that happen to us? They call them, first of all, they call them earworms, is that right? Which is a gross thing. That, I mean, I don't really understand that, but it, gets, it burrows its way into your head and you can't stop singing it. And isn't it true that it's never a song that you like, it's a song that you wish you could stop singing? That gets in your head. The other day I met a guy named Tom Jones. Not the guy who's the lounge singer in Vegas, but a guy just had that name. And I only know one Tom Jones song. It's the song, It's Not Unusual to Be Loved by Anyone. You know that song? You know? And I don't know why, but I could not stop singing that song. I'm singing it around the office. I'm singing it, I was singing it in our church board meeting. And, our, <laughs> and the guys look at me like, what? I'm like, I don't, I, I'm sorry. I can't stop singing the song, right? It gets in your head. Do you ever wonder if that's just a modern thing? Does that just happen to us, contemporary people? Did it happen to ancient people? Did Jesus ever get a song stuck in his head, do you think, with the disciples? And if so, what would it have been? Like, what songs? They didn't have top 40. What, did he, what, did he, what was going on? Do you have this experience? Driving down the road, radio's on, you hear a song from your childhood you haven't heard in years, and you remember every lyric. You're singing along, right? It's in us. If the disciples and Jesus got songs stuck in their heads, what do you think they were? <laughs> you could probably guess. Right? I, I'm not joking. I think if it happened to them... It was the Psalms. These, this was the music of their childhood. This was the songs of their people. This is what they sang at home. They sang in synagogue. They sang at the temple. This is the songs that they grew up with and that it would be repeating in their mind and in their hearts the songs of the background of their soul. And we're going to study this ancient book, which has been this, the songs, poems, prayers of God's people down through the centuries. N.T. Wright, New Testament scholar, said when he was a boy uh, singing in the choir in church, he almost learned to memorize the psalms by heart because they just sang them over and over and over in church. He writes this in a book he wrote called The Case for the Psalms, which is a fantastic book. It's in our recommended read list in that little booklet, which you can pick up next week. The psalms are the poetry of a nation, the songs and prayers of Israel through the centuries. They were the songs Jesus and the disciples sang as children, for over 2,000 years, the Psalms have been at the center of Christian worship, serving as both the backbone of corporate praise and the heartbeat of private devotion for God's people. And I think that's true. One of the reasons I love the Psalms, and maybe you do, or people generally do, is because you can always find yourself in them. The word psalm comes from the Hebrew word psalmoi, which means praises, or hillels, the praises. And we tend to think sometimes if we don't know them that they're all just happy, clappy praise songs to God. That's not at all what the Psalms are like. If you've read through them, you know this. There's a lot of things in the Psalms that are almost scandalous in their honesty. They're very raw. You can find the heights of praise and exaltation to God. You can find the depths of despair and loneliness and agony in the Psalms and everything in between. So for the next 10 weeks, we're gonna, we've chosen 10 Psalms that sort of cover the range of human experience. And we invite you to not only hear God speak to you through them, because they are his word, but also to learn how to respond to him from what's actually in your own heart. As Shakespeare put it in King Lear, we should speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. Sometimes in church you think there's things you ought to say. You feel certain things, but you wonder, I'm not sure you should say this in church. God might get offended, so I'll say what I think I should say. And that seeps into our prayer life. Newsflash. He already knows, right? So you can tell him. And the Psalms, in a way, give us a vocabulary to say what's in us, not what we think ought to be in us, and learn how to talk that way to God. And that's a very, very good thing. So I hope you'll take that invitation and read along with us. At least the 10 we're going to study. Maybe you'll be bold, like I'm going to try, and read through the entire book of the Psalms over the next 10 weeks. So let's, let's go to the first Psalm. Good place to start. And it's here's my Psalm and read 
Psalm 1. Now, I'm in a group of men on Tuesday mornings that we uh, have been met for a number of years. We encourage each other. We memorize scripture together. We pray for each other, share our struggles together. We open every time we meet on Tuesday morning by reciting Psalm 1. I have memorized this psalm in the New International Version. I have tried to memorize it in the English Standard Version, which I'm going to read for you, and I keep messing it up. So, let's, I'll read it. You can follow along with me. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, and his leaf does not wither. In all he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Maybe it's familiar to you, at least part of it anyway. The author of this psalm is not named. Most of the psalms are written by King David, but not all. Some are written by other uh, worship leaders in ancient Israel. Some are anonymous. This is an anonymous one. Most Old Testament scholars think this was uh, written as sort of a summary or an introduction to the whole compilation, the whole collection of psalms. He writes this, this psalm. And you could divide this psalm neatly into halves. The first three verses we might call the way of blessing. Verses 1 through 3. And the second three verses, 4 through 6, the way of destruction. I, I think, honestly, this is one of the things that sometimes troubles people, even me, about this psalm and some parts of the Bible. It seems so definite, doesn't it? I mean, it says there's, you're, it's, it's, you're either blessed and prosperous or wicked and cursed. And there's no middle ground. Does that trouble anybody? I mean, part of it is, that's not very politically correct today. We don't like to talk that way. Also, it doesn't exactly line up with our experience. I mean, in my experience, I don't know about yours, people are not all, they're a mixed bag. I am. I'm not one thing or the other. And also, life is not black and white like that. There's, it's, it's, it's gradations. It's, it's nuanced. And so, what do you make of this statement? You know, there's a blessed way of, of prosperity and righteousness, and there's a cursed way of destruction and death. And that's it. In fact, I've had people say, this is the problem with the Old Testament. God's kind of angry and harsh, and I like Jesus in the New Testament. He's much nicer and easier to swallow. Okay, let's go to the New Testament. Jesus says, broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many are on it. Narrow is the road that leads to life, and only few find it. Sounds like Old Testament stuff. Or hey, maybe the most commonly quoted verse in all the New Testament, John three sixteen, For God so loved the world. That sounds nice. That he gave his only son, that whoever believe in him should not what? Perish, but have eternal life. We don't see it because we sort of, we, we, we sentimentalize it, but it's right there in that verse. It's either life with Christ or perishing without him. My point is, this is the theme of the Bible. There is a dividing line. And we're given that same dividing line here in the beginning of Psalms. It's important for us to see that. We'll come back to that as we go. The whole key, I think, to understanding this psalm and this, this concept is getting what the author means by blessed. What, what is blessed? Hashtag blessed. Hashtag the blessed life, right? You know, a blessed to find a parking spot so close to the front door. Blessed, I'm blessed. You know, feeling blessed today? What does it mean to live the blessed life? What is the blessed life? The word blessed in Hebrew is the word baruch. It means happy. Fortunate, lucky, or joyful, fulfilled. In fact, it could easily be translated happy, happiness. Happy is the one who. And as Americans, we're obsessed with happiness. I mean, we're, we're committed to it. It's right in the Declaration of Independence, right? We put it in our founding document. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are, endowed, are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are, say with me, life. Liberty and the pursuit of happiness. You can say blessedness. The pursuit of happiness. We call it a pursuit. It defines the American life. We're pursuing something. We're chasing something. You look around. Everybody's in pursuit. And despite what their social media feeds say, I think very few are experiencing it. A truly blessed life. A truly happy, fortunate, fulfilled, joyful life. Let me read to you an excerpt from David Brooks' uh, article in the New York Times a few years ago. He's a great author. I don't know if you know about David Brooks, but I would recommend him. His book, The 
The Second Mountain. It's fantastic, his book, The Road to Character. But this is an article he wrote called The Miseducation of the Young in Our Culture Today. He says, people in their 20s today seem to be compelled to bounce around more and more, popping up here and there, quantum-like, with different jobs, living arrangements, and partners, while hoping that all these diverse experiences will magically eventually add up to something. All the while, social media makes the comparison game more intrusive than ever, and nearly everybody feels as if he or she is falling behind in some way. And how do we as a society prepare young people for this uncertain phase? We pump them full of vapid but haunting praise about how talented they are, how their future is limitless, how they can be anything they want to be. Then we preach to them a gospel of autonomy that says all the answers to the deeper questions in life are found in getting in touch with your true self, whatever the heck that is. I think he's right. And I don't think this is just an issue for the young. I think it's an issue in our culture. I see it in my life. I see it in yours. I see it all around us. Do you see it? We're chasing, we're pursuing, but what? Where do you find it? So if we're going to pursue happiness or blessing, let's ask the question, what does the blessed life look like? Really, what, is, what, is, what does it look like that we're after? The psalmist tells us. Right here in Psalm 1, he gives us three negatives, one positive, and one profound image or picture to describe it to us. Three negatives, one positive, and one picture. Psalm 1, 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. It's not an accident that the description of the blessed life or happy life begins with things you should not do. This also is, runs contrary to our culture. He doesn't begin by telling all the things you should do. Be true to yourself. Fulfill your own desires. He says, okay, you want to talk about true happiness, true blessing? True happiness begins by turning away from certain things. You believe this? I mean, really, do you believe this? Do you believe that your happiness, your deep joy in life is found in turning away from things, in saying no to things, in denying yourself certain things? Most in our culture would say, no, 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 that's repressive, that's restrictive. You want to be fulfilled and joyful, you must, you, you, you must give free license and reign to your desires, not suppress them. The psalmist tells us the exact opposite. Blessing begins in knowing what to say no to, who to listen to, and who not to listen to. Titus 2, verse 11 and 12, Paul says to Titus, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, and it teaches us to say no to worldly desires. So three negatives. First, Walks not in the counsel of the wicked. I'll put it this way. Who are you listening to? That phrase walks, this is a metaphor throughout the scriptures for our, our journey in life. That the walk, Paul says in Colossians and in Ephesians, walk in a manner worthy of the calling that you have received. Your walk matters. Walk is a metaphor for the direction you're heading. And he, used, he talks about the counsel, meaning who you listen to determines where you go, the direction of your life. So he's making a very plain statement here. Who are you listening to? Who do you go to when you're not sure which way to turn in life? Who are your trusted advisors and counselors? Who speaks into your mind and heart that you listen to and make decisions based on? Who is that? Best friend? Facebook? Social media? Mom? Dad? Your own inner voice? What is it? Who do you listen to? Who do you trust? The trajectory of your life is related to the people you trust and the counsel you keep. You and I, we need to surround ourselves with people who love us, but who love God more. This is really important. They love you, they care about you, they know you, but they love God more than you. So they'll tell you the truth because they know and love the truth. Not just what you want to hear. Not just what they think you want to hear. Second, stands not in the way of sinners. So first, we're walking not in a particular counsel, listening to the wrong voices, and then we find ourselves standing in a particular way. Who are you following? Who are you imitating? Who are you trying to be like? Children, of course, are natural imitators. This is cute when they're young. They dress up like they're heroes. They play, pretend, and that's fun. Do we stop doing this when we get older? Do you stop doing this? Well, you stop wearing the costumes, although I think it'd be cool if you came in a tutu and a cape to church next week. That'd be fun, right? I would like that. But 
maybe we're more, we're more sophisticated about it, but we don't stop. We are natural imitators as human beings. We're all emulating someone or something, following a pattern, looking for someone to model our life after. And th- our culture is just bombarding us with people to follow. I read a book a years ago called A Season of Life written by a man named by, uh, Jeff Marks, and he followed around this coach, uh, Joe Ehrman, who was a former NFL player who was coaching this high school team. Uh, and he's, Ehrman's whole premise was football gave him a crucible in which to shape young men in what matters most. And he says in this book, there's three false definitions of manhood in our culture today. Some of you may have heard this before. This is really helpful to me over the years. He says the first false definition of manhood is when you're a young man, a young kid, it's physical prowess. Who can run the fastest or throw the ball the farthest? That's the man on the playground, right? Then, when you get into adolescence and later adolescence, it's sexual conquest. Who gets the most girls? That's the man. And then when you get into adulthood, it's economic success. Who makes the most money, has the most toys? That's the man. And we don't replace one for the other. We layer them on top of each other in our culture. So, who are the men in our culture today? Those professional athletes, physical prowess? Those who have the most relationships with the prettiest girls, sexual conquest, and those who make the most money. Well, no wonder we have a crisis of manhood. What are we raising up for young men to follow? And this is not just for men, women. You have the same false, different, but there are false definitions of what it means to be a woman. What does it mean to be a woman in our culture today? What's good about that and right and pleasing to God that we should chase after? And what's false about it? I'm just asking the question. The psalmist asks, you want a happy, blessed life? Who are you listening to? Who are you imitating? Who are you following? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Follow me as I follow him, because he's worth following. And then, then, then the psalmist goes on and says the third one, sits not in the seat of scoffers. I would say it this way, who are you becoming? You listen to the certain voices long enough and you start going a certain direction and you find yourself among them. And you do that long enough and you become one of them. The phrase sit is a a euphemism in Hebrew language for uh, acceptance and shared identity. To sit down with someone was to say, you're you're one of my my people. We're we're together. We're of one. I accept you. I identify with you. We, We can sit together. You see what he's, so this is not three ways of saying the same thing. The psalmist is showing us a very profound progression spiritually. Who you listen to determines the path that you head. And the path that you head over time determines the kind of person you become. I've talked to so many people who said things like, I don't know how I got here. I don't know how it ended up this bad. I don't know how this happened. Actually, you do. You can rewind the tape and you can look and see. Who are you listening to? Who are you following? Who are you becoming? You want the life of blessing and joy and fulfillment and happiness? Let's start by asking the question, who are the trusted voices in your life? Who are you modeling your life after? What kind of person are you becoming? And maybe you've got those wrong. Many, many do. Happiness is, friends, the byproduct of something else. The reason I think he begins with three three negatives is because happiness is not found by focusing on it. I think the surest way to a miserable life is to be fixated on your own happiness. If you're always obsessed with how happy or unhappy you are, guess what? You're gonna, it's going to elude you. It's like trying to hold water in your hands. You, it's going to seep through your fingers. Happiness, is blessing is found by focusing on something or someone else. It's a byproduct of a different focus. That's C.S. Lewis wrote an essay called First and Second Things. In his essay, he says you can't get second things by trying to make them first things. Here's what he means. You you, you want a a good marriage, a good job, you want your kids to succeed, you want certain things in your life. Those are second things. They're good, but they're not first things. And if you focus on those things and try to make them ultimate, that's what he means by first, you'll miss them. But Jesus says the same thing in Matthew 6, 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. Keep first things first. This is what I think the psalmist means when he says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, delighting in the Lord. This is what he's talking about, delighting in the Lord, in the law of the Lord. Well, what does that mean? When I first read this years ago, and I was thinking about, and I was growing in my faith and 
young Christian, I, I thought, delighting in the law of the Lord. I'm not sure I understand that. Because I thought of the law of the Lord as the rules. Do you think of it that way? Like the law of the Lord is like, that's the place where all the rules you have to follow is. All the things you're not supposed to do and the things you're supposed to do. And Lewis, in actually in his book, Reflections on the Psalms, says, I could understand obeying the law, respecting the law, revering the law. But calling the law sweeter than honey, delighting in it, that doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, who reads the U.S. tax code cover to cover and says, it was delightful. It is a delight. Have you ever seen a post on Instagram with a sunset scene and a quote from the U.S. tax code on it? Right? No. Nobody does that. We don't delight in that. That's weird. Only the, only the accountants read that stuff and tell us what it means. We just, uh-huh. So we, this is not what the Bible means when it says the law of the Lord. The law of the Lord is speaking about the whole of, the, of, of God's re- revelation of himself in Scripture. The whole story in which we discover who he is and what he's like and what he wants for us. And that's delightful. It's delightful. It's crazy and strange and overwhelming at times, but there's delight in it. So when the psalmist says, by the way, I think it's also important, here's the things not to do. And he doesn't give you a list of 40 things you have to do. It's one thing. Just one thing. Remember the movie City Slickers? You know what the meaning of life is? This. Your finger? No. One thing. Remember Curly? Is that another one that watched that movie? <laughs> it's delight yourself in the law of the Lord. Find God delightful in his word, in his law. You see, delighting in the, in the law of the Lord is not different than delighting in the Lord himself. Here's what Lewis writes about it in Reflections on the Psalms. The order of the divine mind embodied in the divine law is beautiful and worth delighting in. What should a man do but meditate on it daily and try to reproduce it in his own life? Psalm 34, verse 7. Some of you will know this one, even if you don't know the reference. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you what? The desires of your heart. Now, that's a fascinating verse. I've been around people that define it this way. They, they, they interpret it this way. I have desires of my heart. Do you have desires of your heart? Who has desires in your heart? It's things you want for yourself, for your family, those that you love, anybody? Some of you know? Nope, low expectations, Pastor Jeff. I don't delight, desire anything, right? <laughs> and I'm never disappointed. Right? No, no, we all have desires of our heart. And so some people think, well, if I delight myself in the Lord, whatever that is, then he's going to give me those desires that I already have in my heart. Kind of like rubbing the lamp. You know, the G- and God comes out. I delight myself in the Lord. God comes out. I'll grant you your three wishes. You did it right. That's, not, that's a bad interpretation. A better interpretation, although not quite perfect, is this. Well, I delight myself in the Lord, and then he sort of sorts out the desires of my heart. Some of them are good, and he gives those to me. Others are not so good, and he sort of reorders those and, and takes some away and replaces them. That's a better way of thinking about it. But I still don't think it's what the psalmist is saying. Here's what he's saying. Delight yourself in the Lord. Well, what's that? Make him the object of your desire. And you find something out. That he is actually behind all the desires of your heart. He's what you've wanted all along. And guess what? That's what he gives you. Himself. Delight yourself in the Lord and that becomes the desire of your heart. And that is the very thing that he gives you and longs to give you. And that, I think, that the psalmist is telling us is the secret, the key to the blessed life. Delighting yourself in the Lord. Making him the object of your desire. We, we naturally delight in the things that we desire. And we desire the things we delight in. Moms and dads, you, you, you intuitively know this. Grandma and grandpa. You get it, right? You delight in the things your kids do. Even if they're dumb things. How many of you have put a drawing on your fridge that was terrible by any standard of artistic talent? But you delight in that. It's a whale, mommy. That's not a whale. It's an oval. It's not even the right color, right? Whales aren't pink. Oh, it's beautiful, right? My point is, we delight in those things we desire. We desire those things we delight in. There's a relationship here. The psalmist is saying, you want a life of blessing and happiness? The pursuit of happiness is not found in giving free reign to the, all of your desires that you find inside yourself already. That's the lie of our culture. It's found in saying no to certain voices, tuning out certain voices, and turning your mind and heart to one thing, and one thing only. The one who made you, the one who loves you, the one who's pursuing you, how, how ironic, we're pursuing happiness over here, and the source of it all is pursuing us in love through Christ. Oh, that we would turn to him. <laughs> He's it. 
And then the psalmist goes on and says, on his law, he meditates day and night. Now, for years I thought that meant like, okay, I don't know if I can do that, but like, i got to walk around thinking biblical thoughts all the time. You know, i got to be in my nose in the Bible all the time. But think about this for just a minute. The people that would have wrote this poem and read this poem and known this poem and song in Jesus' day didn't have personal Bibles on their smartphones, didn't have personal Bibles that they could take home with them. They didn't have personal Bibles at all. How do, they do, how do they meditate on the law of the Lord day and night if they don't have it with them? How about they do have it with them? Psalm 119, verses 9 through 11, I taught my boys this when they were young. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. In fact, the word meditate uh, is the same root word for uh, the word to murmur and to chew. Isn't that cool? Do you know how, it, you, it's, uh, it's it, the same root word for a cow chewing its cud. Do you know how cow stomachs work? It's kind of gross, but fun, I'll tell you. <laughs> they chew on the plant matter, they swallow it, they bring it back up, they chew on it some more, they swallow it, and they bring it back up, they chew on it some more, and they swallow it, and they bring it back up. I don't advise that for us, humans don't work that way, right, physically. But there's a spiritual principle in here. Chew on. Murmur, repeat to yourself in your own mind and heart. Think about deeply over and over again the word of God. Let it get inside you. Bring it back up again. Think about it some more. Take it in until it becomes part of you. That's what he's saying. It doesn't just mean memorize a bunch of stuff, know a bunch of facts. It means let the word of God, as we learn in Colossians, dwell in you richly. Let it get inside of you. This is the secret, he says, to the blessed life, the happy life. One thing. Focus, intense, intentional focus, mental effort toward one end. To know who God is and the depth of his love for you in Jesus by meditating on his word. This is the power of the image of the tree, by the way. So he said, three negatives, one positive, and one beautiful and powerful image. The image of the tree planted by streams of water. I love this picture here. I've got it on a little postcard in my office. Um, don't you just want to go there? I mean, particularly today. But isn't that a scene like you just like to, I'd like to, I could imagine myself just plopping down by that tree. Maybe my, my kids are swimming, not fighting or drowning each other, but swimming nearby, you know. My wife is nearby, and we're, it's a beautiful, you can, can you almost feel the warm breeze and hear the birds? And so he says, this is, this is the image I want you to have of what your life would be like if you, if you delight yourself in me. A tree deeply rooted by source of living water which yields its fruit in season. Notice he doesn't say, it, 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 there are seasons. It doesn't mean externally everything's always fine. Like the Lego movie, right? Everything is awesome. Everything is cool when you delight in the Lord. <laughs> it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean you don't, you're immune to pain or you don't have hardship in your life. What it means is I've got a deep subterranean source of life and blessing in my life that my circumstances cannot take away. I'm planted I'm not there accidentally. I'm planted, rooted deeply. And so when the season of dryness comes, and some of you might be in that season right now, or even apparent deadness when, when things, there's not much fruit. I've got a source of life and joy that, that runs beneath, that, that holds me. I'm anchored in it. That's the image. We say in the group of guys that I'm in, we want to be Psalm 1 men. Well, I... I think God wants us to be Psalm 1 people, Psalm 1 women, and Psalm 1 men, deeply rooted in his love and in his truth, not listening to all the voices of our culture, not giving free license to every desire we find inside ourselves, because some of them are just wrong, but focusing our mind and heart on one thing and one thing only. What a perfect way to start this journey through the Psalms. This is the singular focus of the whole Bible, particularly the Psalms. The Lord, delighting in him. This is the power of that image. This is what he wants for us. And there's a, a place in, in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Uh, the, the movies are great. I like them, but the books are much. I know that sounds pretentious to say that, but the books are better. And there's a place where Pippin, one of the hobbits, is looking into the face of Gandalf after a great tragedy has just happened. The wizard, you know. And, he, and Gandalf looks really, really sad. Here's what, he, here's what, the, what Tolkien writes about it. In the wizard's face, he saw at first only lines of deep care and sorrow. Though as he looked more intently, he perceived that under all there was a great joy. 
a fountain of mirth, enough to set a kingdom laughing were it to gush forth. I love that. Under it all, there's something running that can't be taken away. A fountain of joy and mirth and happiness. Blessed is the person who listens to the right voices, who turns their life in the right direction, who becomes the right kind of person. That happens in only one way, by meditating on the law of the Lord, delighting in it, making it your singular, singular delight. I'm not preaching this to you as somebody who always does that. I, I, I get distracted by the wrong voices too, and so do you. But what a good thing for God, what a gracious thing for God to say to us right now. You want joy and happiness? It's, we say it in Revelation, you, the pursuit of happiness. Where is that? Walk not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of scoffers, but delight yourself in the law of the Lord. Meditate on him day and night. Then you'll be like that tree planted by streams of water. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we know and we affirm that you are the only one who has ever kept this law perfectly. And we know that when we delight ourselves in you, you realign our hearts. We ask, God, that by your spirit you'd help us to discern your voice above all others, to seek your counsel. We'd ask, we ask you, God, that you would help us to follow after the example of your son and that we would learn to sit with you and become like you. This is the path you've laid out for us that you desire for us, the only path in which we find real, lasting, true joy, the truly blessed life. Thank you for the way that you love us. In Jesus' name, amen.